<clears throat> well, welcome once again to Artwork, everyone. Uh, we're continuing with our series of uh, looking at artists who are represented in this year's uh, West Michigan Area Show. And we're pleased to have with us today um, Hayner Keith Downey and um, quilt maker Elizabeth King. Um, we'll start first with uh, Keith Downey. Uh, Keith describes himself as an eclectic painter, I think in part because even though aspects of his work are very realistic, um, there's also a kind of conceptual basis underneath. Um, so he uses realistic imagery uh, combined with collage-like elements or quotations from art history to really uh, make us think outside the box and perhaps question uh, our assumptions uh, about reality. Um, his work, uh, Winter Doom with Premonition, was the grand prize winner uh, for this year's West Michigan Area Show. <clears throat> And it's featured, uh, people see it prominently when you walk right into um, the uh, gallery. So uh, please welcome Keith Downey. Thank you. Great. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, it's a great honor to win this uh, award this year. Um, no small matter uh, to me. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the uh, Kalamazoo Institute of Art uh, for the award. Uh, I guess specifically, uh, uh, I don't see him here today, Mr. Uh, David Isaacson, who is the sponsor of the award, um, and his uh, wife's uh, honor, uh, Helen Sheridan. So uh, uh, thank you again. Um, relative to the show, I would say thank you to the Institute also for continuing uh, the show. These kind of um, juried uh, uh, local regional shows are dying rather quickly across the country for a number of reasons, uh, at not least of which is just how difficult it is to curate uh, new media today. Uh, you know, the show's rather conservative, mostly painting, three dimensional uh, objects. Uh, we're not dealing with video artists, installation, performance artists, and that's where a lot of the energy in the art scene is. Uh, I'm, uh, and the reason uh, uh, places like the Art Institute of Chicago uh, do not do these shows anymore. They just got too uh, unwieldy to do. Um, uh, I appreciate the effort uh, having worked in a museum. I know it's a lot of work uh, for the staff. It's kind of an unwieldy um, uh, kind of process, but I, I do want to reassure you that the local artists appreciate it. I know I do. Um, uh, uh, for as long as I've been painting, my exhibition history isn't that long. I really value these um, uh, kind of venues. And of course, the imprimatur of a, uh, an institute like the KIA uh, is also a, a, a highly valued um, marker um, for an artist like myself. So I, um, I appreciate the effort on the part of the uh, KIA, and I encourage you to uh, keep going uh, with that effort. Um, uh, quickly, just a little of my background. Uh, I'm fond of saying uh, I used to be an aspiring artist. I'm an expiring artist at this point. Uh, uh, there's good points to that. However, at this point, you've been doing it so long, uh, you really kind of don't care anymore. And I, um, uh, there's, I have no major goal on the horizon. Um, uh, there's plenty of mornings I wake up and think, Oh, God, I just picture the mess in my studio basement and think, why am I doing this? And I, I don't have a good answer. Uh, I wish I could say uh, uh, that passion burns so deep in me, I can't stop. <laughs> I think it's actually sunk costs. Uh, uh, 
at this point, when you've uh, uh, spent so much time, so much money, so much effort, so much space of your life in it, uh, to turn around now would be uh, uh, just signing all that off. So uh, um, I, I think that's where I find myself more. Uh, as Greg said, I am an eclectic painter, and maybe now uh, more than ever, um, uh, and that comes with, I think, a lot of the negatives that eclectic tends to mean in the art world, which is uh, uh, not focused, you know, not hard-nosed enough, not exploring uh, deep enough. Um, again, at this stage, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm really not too worried about uh, uh, I, those accusations might be true in my case, so I'm not too worried about it. Um, uh, quickly, I'm a native uh, Michigander, uh, east side of the state, grew up, uh, went to school in a distant land, East Lansing, Michigan State University, where I got my uh, uh, Bachelor of Fine Arts degree. And then uh, not long after, I uh, moved to Chicago and spent almost 25 uh, years there. Um, uh, I love uh, Chicago very much. Uh, my um, uh, then wife said the city is for uh, young people and rich people. And uh, I wasn't rich and I, I definitely wasn't getting any younger. Um, so a few things called us uh, back here. And instead of going to the east side, we landed in uh, western Michigan, uh, very beautiful western Michigan. And I uh, now live in um, Muskegon. Uh, um, for all my time in Chicago, the biggest thing I took away from there, I think, was uh, uh, my capacity for viewing artwork. The biggest advantage of living in a city uh, for me wasn't connections and shows. It was uh, uh, the opportunity to view tons of artwork, both uh, at major museums like the Art Institute. And then um, Chicago still has a pretty vibrant uh, uh, commercial art scene, which you really don't uh, find till you get into some of the more, um, uh, the larger um, cities. Um, uh, when I got back uh, to Western Michigan, uh, I really hadn't, didn't have a plan. I was gonna, we were gonna take a, a, a couple months off I like to say, I think I am the last person in the country that found their next job in the newspaper. Uh, I mean, who looks in the newspaper want ads for, uh, we had settled in Holland originally. I'm looking through, of all things, the Holland Sentinel, and I see the Muskegon Museum of Art seeks a preparator. And I had never, I knew what a preparator was. Google doesn't. Google still wants to correct it. It does. It's like it's not a word. How's that for your self-esteem? Uh, 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 I'd never seen the word in print. I wasn't sure where Muskegon was from Holland, honestly. And I said I got to go up and talk to him. Instead of going on a two-month vacation, uh, I was on a two-week week break, and uh, about January fifth of uh, I guess what would have been 2003, I was working at the Muskegon Museum of Art. It's a great uh, small museum, not unlike the uh, size of the KIA. Uh, they're putting a big um, addition on now. It's going to be substantially larger in about two years. Um, one benefit of being a preparator in a small museum like um, the Muskegon Museum of Art, uh, everybody wears a lot of hats. Uh, if you're a preparator at the uh, Chicago Art Institute, you're a white glove guy pushing carts around. Well, I sat in on exhibition meetings, designed exhibitions, uh, handled million dollar artwork for framing and matting. Uh, it was like my dream job uh, landed on my head out of the blue. So it was a great way to uh, end my working career. Um, my full-time working career. And from there, I, uh, I worked as an adjunct at Muskegon Community College, both uh, some painting and drawing, and also I ran a small 
museum studies course, which was essentially a little recap of the job I did at the museum. Uh, while I'm very happy to uh, win the big prize, um, uh, this wasn't my first uh, uh, effort here. Actually, I've been entering now probably for about 15 years or so. And um, in 2012, I had won third place for one of these two paintings. I'm not, frankly, I'm not sure which it is. I'm, I'm not a good record keeper. Uh, actually, it took me a lot to find this to even recoup this a little bit. It was either this piece or this one. And at the time, uh, I was, uh, it was actually one of the long, for being the eclectic painter, one of the longest focused uh, stretches I had uh, worked on. And they were all these um, uh, suburban, semi-rural ranch homes. Um, I had started doing a little bit of that on my uh, uh, coming back from Chicago. Uh, I was just struck by the different residential setting. You know, for my when you live in Chicago, uh, you know what your neighbor is eating for dinner because the gangway is so small and every, you know, everybody's so packed. You see people all the time. I uh, hear I got, uh, actually, even though this was very similar to the kind of region I grew up in, it all felt kind of new again, this funny little family compound that everybody has, yet you see nobody. What really cemented this for me and what these uh, particular paintings are a product of is, was the 2008 real estate crash ancient history right remember uh anybody remember when that happened uh um i i just remember being jarred by it i really wasn't hurt by it but most of these homes that i did at the time were um abandoned people had just up and left that van oops sitting here sat there for a year and a half before it moved Tires flat, uh, people just packed up and uh, left. Um, last year, I uh, this piece won uh, second prize, so I'm climbing the ladder here now. <laughs> um, and uh, better than winning the prize was uh, I had all three of the entries were accepted, and they gave me a very nice little... Uh, corner back in the back gallery there, and I was very pleased uh, to see those all installed there. Um, this is another, uh, actually kind of a series of paintings I've done. I'm probably uh, done with these now. The wood background in them is not wood. Uh, that is full finished. They're all on hard planks. And uh, I, you know, people imagine that I'm painting the grain in these. There's a Hobby Lobby tool that you splash your paint down and pull the tool across. If you don't like it, you wipe it out and go again. Um, but uh, that, that was kind of a three or four year uh, stretch. And so uh, actually last year's award was a really kind of a nice little uh, cap on that effort. Uh, my painting this year, very traditional painting, stretch canvas, um, lar uh, at the large end for me, not dictated by any uh, purpose other than fitting in my van, my grand, my uh, Dodge Caravan. <laughs> and this can go in on the angle. So that's as big as uh, uh, my paintings and my uh, partner Kate's paintings get. Uh, I had multiple uh, photograph sources for this out at uh, Muskegon State Park. Uh, January of about uh, 2018, I think. This painting had two kind of distinct uh, lifespans. And what I did, uh, when I compare this a little bit, actually the bulk of the painting is made out of the right one, but the prominent tree is from this one. I didn't care for the composition of the photo and combine those. There's the main image and essentially what i did was take that tree and transplant it into the uh, 
uh, the, uh, the main image. And here's the original state of that painting. Um, I, I have here about 2019, 20, I think that's correct. In fact, I had delivered it to a gallery uh, where it stayed, <laughs> I think, un, unseen for a year, brought it home and it kicked around in my studio. I, I liked the painting. I was never in love with it and uh, had the impulse to start fussing with it a little bit. And this little element, I do not, uh, I do not rely on the computer a lot uh, for my work. And so this is a little bit unusual for me. I had painted over with a little painting tool uh, over the tree and just roughly cut that form out and um, uh, end up pasting it back into my original uh, painting. Um, so uh, uh, on the right, you're still looking at my working digital image. Uh, uh, and a photograph of, of my painting. Um, now, this is no small matter to inject a pink tree into an already uh, uh, finished landscape. Doesn't sound like the biggest risk in the world, but uh, it's a lot of work to repair if it goes south on you. Um, but uh, I think the immediately uh, when I saw this little... Uh, um, uh, just the oddity of the tree in there, I, that just clicked for me. I, I knew I had a, a little uh, more promising uh, pain than what I had started out with. Uh, uh, you can see over here, that's actually the digitized version of it, and it's floating over uh, everything. Uh, and in, in fact, uh, I like that so much in the digital image I did not try to make that recede into the um, uh, landscape. Let me see if I can, uh, you know, I'm covering right over uh, grasses and so forth there. Uh, had I wanted to put that more in the space, I would have done that and brought the, the other objects back up to the uh, foreground. Um, but that just seemed to uh, resonate with me. Um, and so uh, here it is. I start adding a little smoke to it. This is still digitally. And then my uh, final product. You know, some of the uh, difference in coloration probably has more to do with my bad photography than with uh, all broad alterations to the painting. Once I did put the, uh, the uh, premonition object in there, and the smoke. I did have to go back and do quite a bit of painting, and I, I changed the um, the uh, uh, sky and so forth. So there was a, a little reworking of the uh, piece, but actually once I made the decision, it came up very quickly. Um, I don't usually feel um, this positive about an individual work. But I had said to Kate, even as I was getting ready to bring it up, I said, I think I got a winner. And uh, so uh, when it actually won, I was surprised, but not surprised. I, I was uh, uh, pleased with the um, pain. Um, uh, I certainly appreciate its presentation in the show. Uh, to whoever actually installed the show, uh, both of us had to comment uh, what an excellent job it felt like this year um uh at a show like this you know it's tempting to be overly inclusive i felt like somebody held the reins in a little bit and gave everything a lot of nice uh, breathing room uh, despite or or regardless of their actual scale so i thought the show uh, uh read um uh extra well this year and uh, just made it extra satisfying to be um, included. And that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> uh, anybody, any questions, comments yet? <laughs> what is your concept with that big tree? With the pink one? Uh, 
the question is what what was my concept or maybe my intent with the tree uh, uh you know what i wish i could say uh i have a specific intent you know in my painting i tend to react to things i you know i'm always surprised that people set off on a painting with such a distinct goal or idea uh that process of finding this on the computer is really my reaction to uh, what seemed like a more powerful image to me. And um, the, the disparity of it in the, uh, in the original landscape made me picture it more as a premonition. In fact, I, I think I had struggled with words uh, uh, premonition, ep epiphany, or apparition, you know, it sounds like a good painting for the future here, I think. Uh, well, that's, you know, I would say that's the, the natural, um, but I, I did not set off on that, because uh, I want to make clear, um, uh, while I sense that too in the message, I'm getting it back as much as you are. I, I did not set out to make a picture about climate change. And, and the type of smoking. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, <laughs> that's about climate change. <laughs> no, I, I, it, it seemed like it would lend itself to that. Uh, you know, I think about things like uh, the... Uh, uh, the prototypical burning bush, you know, I mean that, that, so it had, it could have been a metaphor or an analogy for several things. I think that's what, what the attraction was to me and why I kind of glommed onto it. Yes. In, in the original landscape, uh, it's the fog and the atmosphere that probably attracted me to the original effort of the painting. Um, but yes, the smoke seemed almost like a natural addition to that. From the houses, yeah, for example? And... Yes. Uh, um, you know, the question uh, has to do more with uh, the landscape atmosphere, I guess. Um, you know, actually, I think that's the toughest part of good landscape painting. We, uh, at the uh, Muskegon uh, Museum, we have a George Innes painting. And it's, it's actually earlier than yours here. It's not uh, as painterly, it's, but the thing I cannot get over in this painting every time I look at it, uh, you can feel the humidity in the air. And um, you cannot paint humidity. <laughs> uh, it's, it's that tight color control and of course, uh, across a bigger distance, you have the uh, atmospheric perspective, not just the physical uh, receding, but the intervening atmosphere that's dulling down your palate. Um, uh, it, uh, it, no particular skill other than looking hard at that picture and working that color uh, down to where it, it just makes sense in there. Um, well, thank you again. Thank you so much. And um, it's a great honor. Thank you. Well, I was going to try and cancel me out here, but I, I'm not moving there for some reason. There we go. <laughs> Okay.
Well, thanks, Keith. That was, yeah, really interesting. Um, our next uh, artist is Elizabeth Kellogg. And uh, Elizabeth uh, has been in love with fiber since childhood, in no part and due to her influence of her mother, who was an uh, expert, expert seamstress. Uh, she made her first quilt, Elizabeth, that is, uh, when she was in high school and has kept on uh, ever since. She had two that uh, she was also a published poet and uh, feels there's a similarity between piecing uh, words together and also piecing together pieces of fabric. Uh, her work, uh, Wall Becomes Window, won the Log Cabin Art Quilters Award uh, this year. And um, we're very pleased to have this with her to talk about her work. So please welcome Elizabeth Kellogg. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. Thank you to the KIA for um, inviting me to speak today. And thank you, KIA, for sponsoring the West Michigan Area Show. It, um, it's one of those events on the uh, calendar that endears everybody in this community to the KIA. I'd also like to thank the Log Cabin Quilters for honoring Wall Becomes Window with their award. And thank you to my friends and colleagues from the Upjohn Institute who have joined us today. Um, that's where I work currently. So the first slide, wall becomes window. This is a piece that's layered both in fact, in that it is three layers of, there's a cotton fabric and then a batting and then uh, another cotton piece. It's layered in fact, and it's also layered in um, personal meaning. It began in an online class with a quilting teacher uh, named Maria Shell. She's from Alaska. She is an absolutely amazing quilter and teacher. She challenged our class to use a photo or a painting of something that we found meaningful or just something that we really liked and find a way to express what it means to us, how it maybe makes us feel or does it bring back a memory. So, but we had to use fabric. Well, two ideas immediately came to mind for me, trees and stone walls. But I'd already made a couple of leaf quilts. Um, this one called One Golden Leaf was included in the 2014 area show here. And the 2019 uh, area show was October Puddles. So I decided since I'd already done trees, I was going to have to do stone walls. I grew up in Connecticut, where the farmers' fields are demarcated by stone walls very similar to this. They're created out of the rocks that the farmers pulled out of the soil that they wanted to cultivate. Um, some of these walls were, I grew up in, were over 300 years old. My hometown was settled in 1670. So these walls always spoke to me of hard work, of people with really strong hands and strong backs people with strong wills who were enduring the um, very difficult situation of settling in a new area. They would survive unpleasant winter weather. And um, they left these beautiful stone walls. They, they were pieces of art that they left for people like me to be inspired by. And yes, I do think that stone walls are art and I'm gonna show you more pictures to prove it. So um, after my freshman year of college, I took a year off to travel with the Up With People organization. And during that year, we spent six weeks in Ireland. Well, talk about stone walls. They were everywhere. These beautiful, rugged walls constructed very much like the, the walls in New England. But these were even older than 300 years. I think some of them were eight, 900 years old. After I got my undergraduate degree, I moved to Lexington, Kentucky to go to graduate school. Now, I remember spending hours 
on the weekend driving around, but I was really thinking about exams and papers, but just driving around looking at these stone walls. I'd never seen stone walls quite like that. Um, the way the, the stones are laid across the, the top, they seem very unique to Kentucky. Well, in the years since, um, I've appreciated the work of artist Andy Goldsworthy. Um, and a few years ago, my husband and I visited Storm King in upstate New York to see some of his stunningly constructed stone walls. Um, I mean, they're amazing. Look at how they wind around the trees. And this wall actually continues all the way down into, um, into a pond. It sort of disappears into a pond only to reappear on the other side. It, this is just an astounding piece of work. Um, you may have seen Goldworthy's stone arch up at the um, Meyer Gardens in Grand Rapids. It's a, it's a beautiful piece. But if you get a chance to visit Storm King in New York, you really should. It is just an astonishing, astonishing place. Well, um, as Greg mentioned, I like poetry. And all of these stone walls got me to thinking about Robert Frost's poem called Mending Walls. I'm sure you all know it's the one that ends with that line, good fences make good neighbors. Well, the, the, the lines that came to me from that poem as I considered this quilt project were, before I built a wall, I'd asked to know, what was I walling in or walling out? So at first I just sort of took the lines at face value. I pondered what I wanted to know before I built a wall. At the time, there was an awful lot of discussion in the media because the previous administration was very determined to build the wall at the U.S.-Mexico border. And I knew that my wall did not want to look or feel anything like that wall. <laughs> my wall was going to be colorful. It was going to have a nice looking gate or some kind of a break so that neighbors could pass easily in between. My wall would just be beautiful to look at, and that was about as deeply as I thought about it. So I pulled out a whole bunch of possible fabrics from my stash, threw them on the cutting table. Um, this was a cutting table that my father made for my mother, who, uh, as Greg mentioned, was quite a seamstress and taught me how to sew. Then I just began to sort and cull through those fabrics until I had what looked pleasing to me. And from there, I began making units, sort of like this, um, and some down here, and then just putting little pieces of fabric up on a, a background just to see what I liked. Um, and with the, the vision in mind of having a wall with an opening between it, I, um, there we go. I first made these two small pieces and, and put them up there. Well, I looked at this for a few days, but, and then was trying to figure out how am I going to put something between there? What am I gonna put between there? Should it just be sky? Um, I tried that, but I, I didn't like that. Um, and then I thought, well, maybe if I made something that looked more like a, a path, well, that really, really didn't work. Um, nothing felt right. I'm sure you've all had those days. So. Um, what I did was put my quilt in time out. And this is what a quilting friend of mine calls it when something isn't working, you just, you know, put it away. Well, after a couple of weeks, I um, decided I wasn't figuring out how to do this, so I just put those pieces together. But even after that, I just didn't know how I was going to finish this thing. I didn't know how to proceed with it. It went back into time out. <laughs> so, but this is also where the meaning of this project started to get personal for me. I started to think deeply about the meaning of walls. I'm uh, sure you're all familiar with the phrase, you know, hit the wall, and I've done everything that I can, and I don't know what else I'm going to do. I can't walk another step. I'm going to go to bed. Um, or the word stonewalling, as in my teenager is stonewalling because they don't want to do their chores or they don't want to answer my question. Um, and as I thought about those, I began to realize somewhat embarrassingly 
that those metaphors were very, very personal to me. Um, there was a very important relationship in my life that just wasn't going very smoothly anymore. And it was a struggle. It was almost constantly on my mind. In quiet moments, as we all have, I'm sure you start to think about, I really need to be honest with myself about this and um, about my friend. And I need to be really deeply, humbly honest. And in those moments, it became pretty obvious to me that I was the one who had built a wall between me and my friend. It was a wall of little grudges and grievances. Um, and I didn't leave any space for my friend to walk through. I'd hit a wall, basically. <laughs> um, a wall of fear, ego, pride, all of the above. Well, so the project put me into a timeout. <laughs> so, but as the days passed, there was a confluence of grace. That's the only way I can describe it that sort of began to sweep me into the stream. When I showed my naughty quilt to my classmates, they all said, it looks like stained glass. <laughs> Not exactly what I was going for. And then a friend sent me a picture of a stained glass church window that they had admired in France. Well, and, and they didn't even know what I was working on. So as uh, these sorts of things began to tumble around in thought, along with the desire now to really work out this relationship, um, a really good friend helped me learn how to sort of look beyond the resentment. And she said that even though the events of the past can't be changed, um, obviously, if, if I would sincerely try to look for the intention behind those um, events and to see that there had never been any ill will, there had never been any intention to harm me or harm the friendship. And I began to kind of see through the resentment or like a stained glass window, just kind of see them in a new light. Even though you can't see through a stained glass window, you can see the light coming at you, through you. You can see the colors. You can see how they change with the light. So as I sincerely, to continue the metaphor, sincerely sought to see the sunlight in my friendship, things got lighter. They got more joyful and more relaxed and we began to see new colors in each other. So at some point I knew that I could get out from time out and I could take my quilt out from time out. So I took it out and um, as Grace would have it, my husband and I were looking at the horizontal quilt one day and he says, what would happen if you turned it vertically? And uh, <laughs> I did and the quilt just said yes. Uh, I can relate to what Keith was saying. We think we're making one thing, but it has its own idea. And this piece definitely said, yes, this is who I am. This is what I want to be. So um, I added a few more pieces um, to the window and I began to ponder how I was going to quilt it and frame it. And um, you can see, I tried out a couple of things. I had a frame and I thought, oh, wouldn't it be cool if this collect connected to that and this connected to that and up at the top. Um, but I can also resonate with what Keith said. Sometimes you just know what's working, what isn't. And that just wasn't, I thought, this just needs to be simpler. So um, then I went about piecing and quilting. This is, it's actually quilted in two different pieces. There was the wall um, that I quilted tightly and separately and then mounted it by hand to the frame that I had also uh, made a quilt. That is three layers and um, quilted around that. And um, then the, the way to hang the quilt was um, also inspired by my husband. He had seen a Japanese piece of art and thought the way they had hung it was really cool and we should give it a try. And I did and it was wonderful. And then my um, son-in-law, our son-in-law, stained and finished the board for me. Probably more than um, any other quilt I've made, this one was truly a labor of love. 
and the lessons that I learned were invaluable, and I'm glad to have this piece with me that's going to endure and remind me of those. I wish for all of you that any walls that uh, you may run into will become windows. And um, that's all I have to say, unless you have questions. <laughs> Um, it was a little over a year, probably about a year and a few months. Yeah. With a few timeouts. With a few timeouts, yes. <laughs> well, thank you. Is that okay? We're good to end? Okay. Unless someone has more questions for, for Keith. <laughs> thank you very much for coming.